Please open your Bibles to James chapter 1, please. Um, chapter 3. Not chapter 1. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the atoning work of Christ. <clears throat> thank you not only for your saving grace, which is beyond what we deserve, but also for your sustaining grace, which we need each and every day. Thank you for your patience that you manifest and demonstrate to us every waking moment of our lives. And as Paul says, that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. May that become reality for everyone here today, Lord, saint and sinner alike. Lead us to the point of understanding the weightiness of your word the reality of your holiness and the necessity of a righteous walk that demonstrates a relationship with you. Save and sanctify for your glory. We pray in your name. Amen. <clears throat> we live in a world that is dominated by self. A world that is predicated on and motivated by a love and a preference of me, myself, and I. The world our children are being raised in emphasizes self-esteem to think of themselves more important than anyone else. It is a world that is detached from biblical authority, biblical morality, and biblical sensitivity to the truth. This world drives a wedge between God's absolute truth and how we live our lives. We are caught in the middle thinking that we have the right to choose the direction of our own lives. We think that we can determine where we want to end up in life as if there is no sovereign God. We make claims to the authority of God in our lives, but live as if he has no right over our every moment that we live. The Bible in most Christians' lives is for Sunday. And every other day of the life, it is me. Biblical standards on manhood and womanhood, morality, decency, the basic concept of a right and a wrong is being eroded as we speak. Our cap capacity to maintain purity and to pursue it above all things is being affected by so many voices in this world. Look at this. Try this. It does not only have to be this. The world the influence not only affects the young, but also adults. The world of sin has invaded our hearts and mind. We think through worldly wisdom on matters of health, on matters of finances, on matters of location that is in relation to where we live with regards to church life on matters of jobs, if a job takes you away from your family 24-7, consider that. On matters of partners, today we don't consider how mature the individual is. We look at how they look. Well, she's a good-looking woman. I've got to marry her. doesn't matter that she's loud. If you've ever re read the book of Proverbs, a loud woman is a... Let me be cautious. Um... You need to be concerned about. That's what Proverbs says. Take note of the loud woman. Sadly, our culture says it doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter how they live, doesn't matter what their convictions are, as long as what? You are happy. Uh, okay. Look at all those who have signed up for trans operations. They are very happy, I can tell you that. For that moment. And then reality kicks in. We are not immune to these influences. We live in a world that promotes worldly wisdom. Respond. The way we make decisions is influenced by the world. Yet, in the book of James, he demonstrates a counterculture to the customs of this world. He shows us a right path, an avenue of righteousness that is available to us if you only walk in wisdom. He shows us that paganism, with all his religiosity and his reology, that is, those who are Jewish but don't really have a relationship with God, is in fact far from God. It looks and sounds right. It claims to have a relationship with God, but there's no evident fruits that a life with God actually exists. The danger James highlights is that your personal profession of faith means nothing if that profession is not supported by a life that shows you have a relationship with God. Listen to James 3 verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness in meekness of wisdom. Faith must be seen. It is not enough for us to say we believe in God and we live as if he doesn't exist. You may come in to the corridors of Living Old Bible Church and say, well, I believe in God. I just don't have to do everything that God says. Be concerned. Why? Listen to what James says in chapter 2. You believe that God is one? You have sound theology. Well, praise the Lord if you do. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know the difference between your claim that has no response to God and a demon's belief in God is that they actually respond to who he is. They shudder. They shake in their boots. They are fearful of God because they know who he is. On the other hand, we claim to believe in God, but we live as if God does not exist. That is a faith that is worse than a demonic faith. At least they tremble. James's concern is not merely to provide wisdom, but to contrast saving faith with the signs of religiosity. A person that claims to have saving faith, but doesn't have it. If we have knowledge and understanding of God, then there must be fruits of, of salvation. And wisdom is one of those fruits. Wisdom's fruits are the signs of saving faith. Wisdom without salvation is not wisdom that honors God. Wisdom apart from God is wisdom that looks inward and benefits the individual, but has no benefit in a relationship with God. Now, what does wisdom look like? In verse 17 of James chapter 3, James begins to outline the practical implications of wisdom. And he says, but wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. <clears throat> the structure indicates that there are three areas that James has in mind, and we dealt a little bit with this last week. He demonstrates the source of wisdom that is from above. He shows the effect of wisdom that is first pure, and then he shows the demonstration of wisdom, which is the outward effect of <clears throat> wisdom. I said it this way. Wisdom is firstly external to us, it comes from above. And that is the source of wisdom. Secondly, wisdom is an internal reality before it is a practical reality in that it is pure first 
in our relationship with God and then demonstrated in how we think about life. That's the effect of wisdom. And then thirdly, wisdom is expressed externally in our interactions with others. And so we began looking at this external factor of wisdom in the middle of last week's sermon. The first reality that is demonstrated externally is this idea of peaceableness. Peaceableness. Wisdom seeks peace. Wisdom is in, not in the business of being a troublemaker, a skinnermont. Wisdom does not major in pride or selfishness or boasting, seeking to exalt oneself, but peace. Always seeking the benefit of someone else. This is not just the, the absence of relational war. Remember I said it's external. So it's not just peace with God, but demonstrated peace between man and others. So this is not just the absence of conflict, but a promotion of what is good before God. Thirdly, this morning we will see that wisdom's effect on our relationship must be seen in gentleness and being open to reason. Those are the two qualities of wisdom we will look at this morning. So it's very simple. So I don't know if you've picked up, but my um, sermons is generally just one long sermon. So five weeks would be one long sermon. And so I just continue from where I left off last week. So what does it mean that we need to be gentle and or kind? There are different words that refer to gentleness. We are speaking about the expression and experience of wisdom in relationships. The external aspect or, or effect of wisdom. Some of these words relating to gentleness contrast harsh behavior with kind behavior. That is meekness, or being mild mannered speaking and that is external that is expressed expressed in relationships however this word has a slightly different nuance and those of you who have greek lexicons will probably fact check me and check it out then that's okay this word is essentially used in this way not to insist on a standard or law that is strange not to insist on a standard or a law. Now, don't misunderstand the meaning of this word. James is not saying don't, um, don't emphasize or don't insist on the law. That is not what he's talking about. The element that is in view here is don't insist on your standard and your law. There's a contrast that is taking place between earthly wisdom, wisdom that is not from above, and wisdom that is from above. Take note in verse 14 again, and, and look at the emphasis of earthly wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, I'm going to back up to um, verse 13. By his good conduct, let him uh, show his, his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have Bitter jealousy, is that inward or external? It's inward. That is expressed externally. And selfish ambition, is that inward or external? Inward. Well, how do we know it's inward? Because it tells us, in your hearts, pretty simple, right? Do not boast against the reality that you are proud, and that's what it means there. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly and spiritual and dem dem demoniacal. I always stuck, get stuck on that word. For where there is self jealousy and selfish ambition, there will also be every vile practice. Take notice. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, that inward look, notice what else exists there. Disorder, chaos, and every pursuit of everything that is not honoring to God. The contrast is, but wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, then 
gentle, that is, does not insist on its own law. So the contrast is between what you naturally desire in earthly wisdom, always looking inward, always wanting your way, versus wisdom that comes from above that does not insist on what your heart wants. See the difference? That's what James is talking about. Not the law, but a law, your law, your standard. This is essential for the former point, if you may remember, when James speaks about peaceableness. You will not have peace if you are a dripping tap that insists on your own way. I know that the Bible uses that of a nagging woman, but men can be as much as a dripping tap as some women can be. And some women will say amen to that. This word means not insisting on every right letter of the law, of your own law. This means not insisting, but being willing to yield, saying, okay, okay, I get it. I, I'm, I'm able to do it that way. You know, when it comes to packing a dishwasher, I'm just saying, we don't have one, so I don't have this problem anymore. So... In my mind, it's a dishwasher, which means it washes dishes. It doesn't say, please pack it in this way. It never tells me that. So, you can see the very sanctifying discussions my wife and I used to have. So, the Lord took away that very sanctifying process. The sense is better understood here when he says, um, uh, uh, gentle. Having a sense of a standard and insisting on it must be this way. And I know that the word is translated gentle and you may wonder why. It's within the scope of the semantic range of the word. But literally it means not to insist on every letter of the law. I'll show you other appearances where this word is used. And just think what I just said, not insisting on that letter of the law. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to give you three examples of how this word is used elsewhere to indicate the sense of this word. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to to your masters with all respect. So, slaves is the word there. Submit, or be humble, submit to your masters with all respect. Now notice what he says. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. He's saying, don't just submit to your boss, your master, when he's good and does not insist on the letter of the law. He gives you flexi time. He's a good boss. He, he allows you to come in when you want. He allows you to clock out when you want. As long as you do your work, he's okay with that. And so you willingly submit to him. And on the other hand, you have a not so good a boss. Who says you've got to be here by quarter to eight. And you've got to leave here at quarter past five. No later, no earlier. And you get there maybe by ten to eight. And it's a half an hour off. This guy, man, let off the law guy. Peter says, submit to him just as much as you would to a good boss. That's hard, eh? Don't just submit to those who are reasonable, but to the unreasonable as well. Those who are actually warped and bent. Those who deviate from the standard of the law and have their own standard that you need to meet. Even those who are morally corrupt as the boss, meaning he's not a believer, you submit. Now obviously if he asks you to steal money, that's a morally corrupt thing. So I don't know how you stay a Christian as a politician. I'm just saying. 
Sorry, Donovan. <laughs> Don't treat your bosses any differently just because one is kinder than the other. The word gentle there is exactly the same as the word used in James. One who does not insist on the letter of the law. And here, it is in a corporate setting. Here, it's in a working uh, uh, situation. So he's a slave owner who has people working for him. And he says, you know what? You've been working me for 10 years. You can come in whatever time you want. As long as you get your work done, by the end of the day, I'm fine with it. If you leave early, I'm okay with it. It's like having a mom and a dad who says, you must finish Every letter in your book. And a, another parent who says, you know what, as long as you've done the hours, I'm okay with it. One insists on the letter of the law and the other insists on, you know what, as long as you do it, it's okay. Doesn't matter how long it takes. We see and experience this on a daily basis. Secondly, you can find it as a quality of godliness in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Turn over to 1 Timothy. If you know your Bible, you would know that this relates to eldership. Here yeah, there's a slight nuance because of the words that precede and follow. But notice what he says. Verse 1, this saying is trustworthy, or this is a trustworthy saying. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. It's a good thing to, to have. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Remember that. Must be above reproach. Husband of one wife. Literally, a one wife man. Sober-minded. I, I don't know how you can interpret that to be a woman when it says one wife Man, I mean, literally, it's a man. So, in, in relation to what um, Hilton spoke about this morning, there is only one interpretation sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Phew, that's a heavy list. Here it relates to the office or the qualification of a pastor. He must not be a violent man, which precedes it. And he must not be someone who is quarrelsome, who follows it, that follows it. This relates to somebody that is not combative. He doesn't look for fights. He avoids it as much as he can. Gentleness fits right between being violent and being quarrelsome. In other words, he doesn't insist on his own way because if he does, he's quarrelsome. If he doesn't get his way, what happens? He becomes violent and he wants to slap people around. I remember a guy saying to me, you know, there's one, some mornings I just wake up and I want to smack some Christians, man, because they don't want to listen to me. I'm like, you, oh, bro, you don't belong in the pastorate. Essentially, what Paul is pointing out here is that it's a quality before it's a visible trait. Before you see it, it's already present in the heart. He's by nature not an insistent man. The two words, pugnacious and peaceable, that surrounds it is important because it gives a little, of, a little bit of context of how he should not be insistent. Because if he is, he's going to be a violent man. If he is, he's going to be a pugnacious or a, 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 a quarrelsome person. An elder needs to be a man of peace. He is the opposite of a violent man. He's the opposite of a bully. He's the opposite of being a bulldog. Pastors must be gentle. Same word. This is a qualification. And if pastors fail on this, what should happen to them? They don't meet the qualification, being above reproach. This means that pastors are not self-seeking or causing conflict. They are not proud men. They are humble. 
they're not insisting on their own way or on their own standard, but they seek to resolve resolutions peacefully, peaceably. Now, don't misunderstand this word, gentleness. And the, the, even the, the entire semantic range, gentleness never means softness. Never means being a doormat where people just walk over you. In other passages, Paul speaks about the conviction that pastors need to have. You preach the word whether the saints want to hear it or don't want to hear it. You cover the hard things whether they like it or whether they don't like it. And he says to Timothy, you insist on these things. A pastor must be insistent on biblical truth. But this is not what he's saying with regards to the quality of a pastor. He's not a person that is a bulldog. He just wants to bite at you and, and hold on to you until you submit to him. Let me put it this way. A bulldog will run right over you and then come and lick you. A sheepdog will herd you until you get to your destination. Bulldogs love to nip. What, what is uh, the dogs that we have that's similar to a bulldog? The Staffy, right? Staffy. They love to nip. Yeah. They don't listen to their masters. I've seen some of your dogs. I'm just saying. And all the bulldogs that I've been around, they've nipped at me and I'd smack them. I know that I'm not the owner, but I don't care. You don't nip at me. Paul contrasts the action of a sheepdog. That's what we are as pastors. Shepherding dogs, willing to come alongside and help them find the right path. Not bulldozing over people. That's a bulldog. This implies that you are a sensitive person. There's consideration in your action and in your or for your speech. The possession of gentleness, as stated here by Timothy and by, by Paul and by James, mutes the quality, the natural quality to be appeased. The sinful desire to be in control and to bully people. Pastoral ministry can be abused by bully. I'm saying to those of you who desire to be elders, we have to be careful for those in those whom we choose to lead God's people. Because if you're a bully, you're not going to be gentle. You, you are going to insist on your way because it has to be done your way. Another example is found in Titus. Now you may say, okay, fine, I can see why it applies to elders. But what about me? For you selfish Christians, Titus chapter 3, verse 2. What about me? Remind them, this is all Christians, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. Hang on. Is there any qualification as to who they are? No. That means all rulers and all authorities, to be obedient and to be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. Hmm. To avoid quarreling. Mm -hmm. To be gentle. And to show perfect courtesy toward all people. All of them relate to how you respond to people. Listen again. To speak evil of no one. Last week it would have made a lot of more sense because I used the analogy of a skinamoint. Somebody that goes and speaks about someone else. And it's not just that you talk about them. It's the content of the conversation. It was a word that was used of spies who used to go in amongst the enemies and go and talk nonsense about his own people. You know that these people, they are the Vicious, most vicious people you will ever meet. I saw them, how they, they just butchered families. You don't want to come up against them. So they go and they talk nonsense. And what does that create? Chaos and fear. That's the whole point of the spy. And 
both Old Testament and the New Testament hangover uses this word to speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling. It's pretty obvious. It doesn't say stop quarreling. It says to avoid it. When you see it coming, what it should, should you do? Avoid it. It's that simple. But why are we so adamant at wanting to have the final say? Because of the next word. To be gentle. Not to insist on every letter of your law. The reason we are quarrelsome is because we, we, by nature, want to have the last. So ever been in a sanctifying debate with your partner? You know what I'm talking about, right? You're married. You know exactly what I'm talking about. How, why is it so hard to walk away and say, you know, sweetie, I, I know I'm wrong in this. And I will not have the last say. And uh, please forgive me and and pray with me. Why is it so hard to get to that stage? Instead, it's more like, yeah, you know what? I don't think you understand what I'm saying. This always happens. Remember last year? Remember five years ago? Why? Why does it happen? Because we are by nature men and women who insist on our own way. This causes conflict. It means that we should not want to be contentious. We should not want to be the person who has the final word on the argument. Remember the course that we did on peacemakers? What is the first question you should ask when entering a quarrel or or a struggle or a fight? How must I Glorify God in this. When James says here that we should be gentle, it means that we should be understanding to someone else. Understanding of their failures, of their faults, of their shortcomings. Not insisting on our own way. Sin and saints have expectations for churches because they have a standard that a church needs to meet. It's got to have an ambience. You know, it's got to have a feel. It's got to be an order. And if, it, if I walk in and I don't feel that, I ain't staying. You know what that is? Insisting on your own law, on your own standard, on your own way. If people don't greet me in a loving way, I'm very busy on a Sunday morning. I stand at the door and I greet people. I'm very busy on a Sunday morning. So if you come up on the back side of me and you just hang there and I don't see you, I'm not going to greet you. And if if I'm in a conversation, I'd I'd like to give attention to the person that I speak with. So if you come up alongside of me and I don't look at you, it's not because I don't want to acknowledge you or I'm angry at you. It's just I respect the person not to be Uh, wandering my eyes. Yet, a person may have this standard. You know what? Pastor didn't look at me today. Or or Uncle Peter just, he just walked right past me. Or maybe Uncle Don, he was so busy walking on his crutches, he didn't even look up. Just saying, if you've got that kind of attitude, then guess what? You are Not the gentle person that James speaks about. You are a person that that is insisting on your own standard. You have a will, you have a way, and if people don't meet it, well, I'm out of here. That's it. I'm done. A person that insists on his own standard have elevated themselves to a place of authority, a position that others must come and meet their standard. Now think about that. You've elevated yourself to a position where others have to come and meet your standard. Who owns that position? There's only one. God. He's the only one that has the right to have a standard that we must meet. 
And you don't get a choice in that. So when we exalt ourselves and place our standards above people, you've just elevated yourself to the place of God. Wisdom tells us to subdue our insistence, our natural desire to be self-exalting. Subdue it. Allow God to have the rightful place that He deserves and subdue your sinful desire to be in control. Secondly, also allow God to change people's lives rather than you being the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Providentially, Scripture makes allowance for everybody here and it's inclusive of every person regardless of their age, their race, their gender, or their longevity on the Christian walk. This requirement are for all Christians. Pure, then peaceable, and then gentle. This changes relational dynamics. I don't know about you, but this is hard. It's hard to apply on a regular basis. Because we struggle with the flesh. Men, this is hard for us. If you are honest, you will acknowledge. Yeah, it's hard for me to take my wife's opinion. Yet God has given us grace in providing us insightful women. They don't see things the way that we see it. That's a good thing. This word is a valuable word that teaches saints the importance of not being insistent for their relationships. If you're an insistent believer, insistent on your way, on your law, on your desires, You will ruin your relationships. Wisdom is not a conflict maker, but a conflict diffuser. A wise person navigates the landmines of relationships, and you know that that's a reality because all of us have to do this. Wisdom goes to the trigger, cuts and diffuses the problem, and doesn't add pressure to the trigger, causing an explosion. You get the analogy, right? Wisdom does not cause more problems. But it prioritizes dealing with the problem and not trying to blow up the person. What James is after is the relational element of wisdom. This speaks of how we use our tongue. Now you can be an insistent person by not saying a word. You see this in kids. They are obstinate without saying that they are obstinate. You tell them to do something and their whole body goes stiff and they don't. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's being insistent. You better break that reed before it breaks you. Insisting on our way will crush the relational peace that we can experience in our relationships. Why does James mention this? Well, in chapter 3, verse 1, he speaks about the tongue, especially for those who are teachers. And so some take this section to relate just to teachers. I don't take it that way. I think it's in general. Um, I'm talking about 13 through to 18. It's not specifically just to teachers because James moves to the general use of the tongue, how we all struggle with the tongue. And so we all lack wisdom when it comes to, to the use of the tongue. Let me clarify this point. When I say that we should not be insistent, I'm not saying that we should not insist on the truth. In your marriage, you should. In your relationships, you should. The truth is the objective reality we must submit under. Sometimes it is uncomfortable to speak about the truth. These sermon series from James chapter 3, I don't know about you, but it's been hard-hitting. It's been the most convicting sermons to my own heart. They say that preachers should preach to themselves first. I sit some mornings working through the text, and I'm like, man, I failed the church. I 
from my family. There's just so many ways I need to repent. It's hard hitting, but it's good for us. We've adopted the sin of pride. We've adopted an attitude of boasting. We've become accustomed to manipulation and vainglory and cover that sinfulness with this term, oh, I'm a perfectionist. No, you're not. You're a person that insists on their own way. That's sinful. Or you may say, I just, I'm just like this. I just, this is me. Mm -hmm. So you want to tell me that God's grace is not powerful enough to change your stubborn heart. Oh, I pray for you, brother. As Byron would say, just stop it already. <laughs> the proud, the arrogant, the controlling, the unsatisfied are those who insist on their own way. You can think about the implications for your marriage and your relationships through wisdom. Is inward looking. Many Christians consider themselves to be wise. If, if you have to measure yourself just based on what we've seen thus far. Pure, peaceable, gentle. Can you make a tick next to wisdom? Am I wise? Wisdom is manifest in the heart of believers as they respond to God first in purity in their relationships seeking peace and that not being insistent on their own way by being gentle. Now, not only is wisdom pure, peaceable, and gentle, but also it is reasonable or open to reason. I've got 10 minutes to finish this. My, the next part of my sermon is a half an hour. I think I can finish it. Do my best. Wisdom is also magnified in being open to reason. You can see how all of these things fit together. They're all relational. This word can have the meaning to be opposite of the person that is obstinate. My, my wife called me stubborn this morning. It's not a good start to a Sunday. But there's a reason she called me stubborn. I hurt my finger yesterday and I don't want to go to speak to a doctor, and so she said, I'm, I'm stubborn. And yes, I, I, I own that. I hate going to doctors. It's not that I don't trust them, but I just don't like to go through that way. However, the word literally means willing to heal, as the New King James Version says. Probably the best translation of this word. It's a difficult word to express in English because most often the element of obedience is emphasized. Now, that, that can be present, but it's usually within certain context where obedience is in view. James is not highlighting obedience to the law and he's not highlighting obedience to another's law. But here, the emphasis is on being compliant and being willing to respond. That is willing to heal. The Vulgate has this word. I struggle with the, with the Latin at times, so it's, um, it's got, probably going to be wrong. Suad debilis. I have no idea how to say that. So ask Google, which literally means easy to be persuaded. Hmm. Isn't it interesting that it follows not being insistent? An insistent person is not easily persuaded. This word appeared initially to contrast those who were difficult, stubborn, the recalc recalcitrant person, the, the person who is obstinate. This word was used to indicate you shouldn't be like that person, the opposite of stubbornness, the opposite of a prideful person, the opposite of an obstinate person. In Plato, the words got slightly 
nuanced and it took on the meaning those who were wise and able to be reasoned with. Those who could be persuaded to a logical outcome. This meaning was consistently used since that time and found its way right into the first century where it was used by the New Testament writers and those who lived during that time. It implies being understanding. It refers not being passive in obedience, but having the inclination to be open to suggestions. <laughs> Sorry. I can just see myself when, when we go driving and my, my wife gives instruction, I generally say, I know where to go. Mm -hmm. And I would lose my way then. I'll find it eventually. I think that most men are like that. This word means, do not be unapproachable. Do not be unapproachable. A person that is so stuck in their way of life that they do not see reason. They want it their way. Ever heard the idiom, my way or the highway? That is this guy. Yeah, it's got to be this way or there's the door. The wise person does not discount counsel. Read the book of Proverbs. How many times he speaks to the young man or his young uh, um, boys to tell them, receive the counsel of your father and your mother, the instruction of your mother. That is what a wise son does. But the unwise son rejects the instruction of his mother and spurns the wisdom of his father. And he becomes a bum lazy person that lies around. A sluggard. The stubborn are not wise. They have no control over their tongue. They have no control in their responses to people. Therefore, they are not open to reason. Wisdom manifests itself in the relational fruits. It's peaceable. It's gentle, it does not insist on its own way, and then it is open to reason. All of these are connected to relationships. The word carries with it an overtone of being forbearing. If you are going to be gracious and open to reason, you have to have an element of grace to those whom you disagree with. Now, this is not related to sin issues. This obviously has not any bearing on the standard of Scripture because you don't reason on Scripture. You stay remain, you remain faithful and focused on what the Bible says. But here, what James has in view is the tenderness and the grace of being open to receive instruction when you may be wrong or when you've not thought of things very carefully. A wise person is not a difficult person. They are quick to hear. They are willing to hear another's point of view. Wisdom shows sensitivity to others. It produces a quality that is easy to be um, entreated and approached. Remember what I said about an elder? He needs to be above Reproach, but an elder should never be unapproachable. Out of all the people in the church, the shepherd should be the most approachable person in the congregation. This is hard to hear, especially, especially for men. I think the, on the other side, it is hard for women to hear because generally the conversation, sanctifying conversation, is ongoing because both want to have the last word. Wisdom informs us that we shouldn't be re rigid on matters that are not eternal in, in value. Go to Galatians chapter 5. 
The Bible helps us to think through these things and provides us also an avenue to replace our sinful habits. It tells us exactly what to do. Now, take note of what the fruit of the Spirit is. And I'm going to use the singular is there because it's singular fruit. Notice what it says. The fruit of us, verse, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, gain such things there is no law. Hmm. How do we get there? This is the quality of those, supposed to be the quality of those who have the Spirit of God. Verse 16 tells us the pathway to experiencing the fruit basket of the Spirit. He says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That is the answer. The reason we struggle in our relationships is because we do not walk by the Spirit. We walk in the flesh and we follow the desires of the flesh. That is why we struggle in our relationships. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. The answer to our relational struggles is found in obedience to the Spirit of God. Whatever He desires, pursue that. Let me push the envelope even more. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Notice how Paul starts with what we should not do. Do not, verse 3, do not or do nothing from self, selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count yeah. others more significant than yourselves. Verse 5, have this mind in Christ, uh, among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It is available to us. What should you do? Don't consider yourself to be more important than other people. Don't elevate yourself to the position of God thinking that others have to please your standard. Don't do that. How do you get there? Follow the example of Jesus Christ. Who? Verse 5. Sorry, verse 6. Who? Though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, becoming nothing. Emptied himself by taking on the form of a bond servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient, even to the point of Death, even death on a cross. What does Paul do here? You've got an example of humility. Stop exalting yourselves. The great God humbled himself and, and, and served you. How much more, you human beings, should you not serve one another? The one who should be worshipped came and served human beings. That is the answer to relational problems. Follow the example of Jesus Christ. Let me just say, if you do not know this one who humbled himself as Lord and Savior, who gave himself up for you, you will always have struggles in your relationships. Having said that, if you are saved, it doesn't mean that the struggle goes away, but it helps us to become obedient to the Spirit, to humble ourselves like Jesus did, which gives us opportunity to serve one another and honor the Lord in our relationship. Wisdom is characterized by purity. It is magnified by peaceableness. It is amplified by gentleness. It is reinforced by a willingness to heal. But it is also full of mercy and good fruits. It is impartial and without hypocrisy. That we will look at next week. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled by the reality of our own stubbornness. 
we tend to follow our hearts and do what we want. The songwriter penned it well when he said, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God of love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and shield it. Shield it for thy courts above. Father, we need you to put us on the trajectory of righteousness. Help us see our sin. Burden our hearts with conviction and change us for your glory. Help us, Lord, to walk in a new pathway of righteousness. Help us to be wise in our conversation. Help us to be wise in our responses. Help us to consider these words that James uses as if we should just know it. Help us to apply these truths at various levels of our lives. Keep us cognizant of the weightiness of what you require of us. Forgive us, Lord, for we fail you so often. And help us to live humbly before you, de depending upon your grace, as we seek to honor you in Christ's name. Amen.